Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 247 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, which we are recording on the 18th of August 2020, although the episode will not go out until the 3rd of September. So, Apologies if anything we say is out of date. Uh, things change very quickly at the moment. Uh, and by we, we say, I mean myself, Pilar Orti, lovely to meet you. And of course, my colleague at Virtual Not Distant, Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit nervous <laughs> about this episode because I am behind a duvet which is hanging <laughs> over a broom handle and no Maya Harry Potter as you said is not here uh, and the, the, the broom handle is then resting on two clamps each on the door of a wardrobe so um, yeah the reason for this I had my holiday planned uh, with uh, in Denia for a week, and of course the British government introduced quarantine. So we thought, let's overlap, let's uh, let, let's uh, in true Spanish fashion, let's do a bridge over <laughs> to the to the September time we had uh, planned here. So we're here for like six weeks, and I'm recording. And actually, I think it's okay. We had this microphone here, so and. Yeah, we just closed the blinds and everything. So so I completely empathize with your heat today, Maya. Yes, because you've got your air gone off as well. Um, but it's, I'm not surrounded by duvets, so that's hardcore <laughs> respect. <laughs> It's good we don't have video. Uh, I do look a bit like a ghost, but uh, never mind. Anyway, so regular listeners, this is a What's Going On episode, so you know what to expect. This is our monthly episode where Maya and I pick some articles or other pieces of content around remote work and the future of work that caught our eye. And then we talk about it. We comment on it, which, uh, which I love. So we hope it helps you stay a little bit up to date with what's going on and also that you take something, uh, something from it or at least that we can keep you company during your household chores or your walk or if you're listening in the future on your travels, your walk to your co-working space or even, even your commute <laughs> when and if you have one. What's so that? <laughs> yes, that's it. The COVID killed the commute. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so um, after we've looked at some articles, we'll cover some of what's going on with us at Virtual Not Distant uh, or, or with listeners or collaborators. It really depends on what's going Going on. What's going on? What's going on? What's going, What's on? going on? So today we've got stuff on tech, on the future of the office, which is also about the future of cities and housing. I'm loving where this is going. And something around work-life balance and, and a very different kind of conference we've come across. So mm -hmm. let's start with the easiest topic, Maya, with the tech. <laughs> the tech, oh, really. <laughs> tech compared to humans and society. Uh, yes, it's uh, much, much easier. So... Um, Yes, we've got this article that uh, if I, let's see how my Wi-Fi works on this. It was uh, published on uctoday.com on the 7th of August, 2020. It's called AI Driven Accountability and it was written by Maya Middlemiss. So Maya, why don't you tell us what this article, what, why you wanted to share this article with us? Okay, yes, I don't feel bad sharing my own stuff, but I, I picked this you one should. out. No. Well, I thought that this one was reflective of a, a little bit of a trend of the kind of things I've been reading about and writing about lately. Um, and so I picked this example of this application from Coolbridge, about, which is a collaboration platform where you can do all the usual things like recording meetings and so on. Um, and some of the new functionality that they've introduced is really changing the meeting, the recording of it, into something that's a lot more useful after the event. 
And it made me think about how meetings, because meetings are the sort of the unit of business decision making and accountability. And obviously, they've, they've changed such a lot. But we've always had the really high stakes decisions have generally been made in meetings, whether that's sort of committee meetings or board meetings or whatever. And then how those decisions and the discussions that support them are recorded and minuted formally and then how that gets acted upon and the way that now we've shifted online that's really changed this Uh, this particular application is something that generates a a sort of ai driven tag cloud and it's it becomes very searchable and so on but what the the change that this is driving is the making the whole thing a lot more transparent. Whether you were in the meeting or not, you don't have to rely on memory. You can go back and this person said this and this person agreed or didn't agree and this is what we decided and there's zero ambiguity there compared to the way that a traditional board meeting might have taken place where all the senior people get together in one room, one person takes notes. Those notes probably aren't reviewed until the next meeting where people have to trust their memory and agree or disagree that it's a fair representation and they can make any changes. But it's, that seems to me a very kind of woolly way of holding people accountable. And there's certainly um, little reminder or input in between those meetings of what happened. And I, I feel like this is really shifting the way that we can get stuff done um, by turning meetings into content making that conversation accessible and it's indexable like you could do a search of all the meetings where you talked about project x and just pull up all the different comments about that and dive straight into the right bit of the recording to just check all of those conversations and i wonder what it's going to do for the way we make decisions and also actually carry out things we said we were going to do in those meetings yeah, I think it's turning the meetings into docu- uh, documentation mm. there and then without having to then go and make uh, the notes. So I think this is it is interesting. It, it brings up a, l- a lot of questions. So there's another I want to um, also let listeners know about TIDV.io, which, come on, uh, uh, what was it? Two, two in something didn't view. <laughs> because we got the other too one. Long too didn't long didn't view. It's TL. Yeah. Oh, TL. So I got yeah. it wrong. Okay. Yeah. So t- too long didn't view, which for me is always th- this too long didn't read and stuff. I'm always like, come on, guys. But anyway, it's something lots of people use. Uh, TLDV.io. And uh, Carlo Tissen got in touch quite pre-COVID, actually. I remember taking his phone call from the workery, from the co-working space. And they've got something very similar. It's a bot that integrates with Zoom. Mm-hmm. And as you are in the meeting, you say, for example, uh, uh, at Maya, this bit is very interesting for you, and it will put that, it will uh, annotate the meeting with that, or this is the bit where we talk about this. So there, is, there are ways as you're going through the meeting, mm. you're basically creating your meetings, uh, sorry, your minutes within the meeting. Yes. Uh, I like and it. I don't know if they've already done it that they can, you can then record yourself into it or something. I don't know if they've done that already or it's in a plan. I don't know, you know, they're planning on it. But really, It is interesting. Um, So we tried this with the uh, IAF, uh, uh, England and Wales Leadership Board, in one of the meetings. And I don't know, in the end, I quite like minutes (laughs) that I can look through. It's always the conversation we have about the difference between uh, the uh, async text, async audio and stuff. But what is really nice is that you no longer, if you want to feel connection, if you want to just get the highlights, it's now not either watching a whole meeting or reading the minutes, you have now something in between. And I think yeah. for me, that's where it adds real value. Yes, I think there there is a definite need for this kind of functionality. And there's this, obviously, the, the tech, people have innovations, but it advances in a certain amount of lockstep. So we're seeing quite a few different solutions coming out, particularly now because all our meetings are taking place this way and they're all being recorded, but nobody can really do anything useful with those recordings when it's a case of, am I going to scan through this hour long conversation and try and find the bit where we said what we were going to do about that thing? Um, it's People have got to find ways of making that content accessible and livable. And this is another solution. It looks like it's based around manual tagging, um, which might be might mean that things could get overlooked, but I quite like the idea of the intentionality behind it, yes. that it could be what anybody thinks is important. I, w- I want to call out and drop a tag here so that we know to come back to this thing or that I know that I might want to find this again or I might want to tag a person in to 
particularly look at this bit. Maybe it was someone who should have been in the meeting and can't be there or something. So I think this is quite interesting and powerful. I don't know, don't know quite the state of readiness of it because unless you sign up, you can't really see very much on this website at the mm, moment. Yeah. Yeah. So listeners, if you've been playing or are using any of these tools, we would love to hear from you, virtualnotdistant.com in the contact form, or you can email me directly, pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. My other thought around this is, um, well, I, I don't know if we're going to have enough time with enough people running online meetings and trying um, tools out, is what could this do to then the way that in uh, co-located in-person meetings are run. Mm. If we got used to this, it might be that actually we decide to record our meeting. I don't know. I think it's it's interesting if we got used to something like this, which when you've got the hang of it could be very handy. And then suddenly you're in a tech-free space. Um, anyway, that's just Yeah, and what ha- what's on the record and what isn't then in those circumstances? Yes. I think that's really interesting. Will it start to become a bit dodgy, the idea of meeting up to have a, a conversation that isn't recorded anywhere? <laughs> yes, yes. And of course, um, the the issue of psychological safety uh, mm. and how the, the recording aspect of, uh, of that, what that does to psychological safety is another big conversation. Mm. Um, be- that's always been the thing with recording, that it's just really great. But actually, uh, how, f- how, you know, how safe do we feel to say exactly what we want when we know it's recorded, even if we've been told that it's only going to be used for X, Y, Z. But I think that's another conversation that um, that would need to happen, I imagine. Yeah, but also it increases safety in other respects that things aren't said or the, the tone or the context in which things are agreed can be captured. It, it would be yeah. a lot more obvious if somebody consented resentfully or under duress yes. to a decision they weren't 100% on board with. Um, it means that you know anything that could be construed as harassment or pressure or inappropriate behaviour is captured forever. And, you know, I think there there are lots of upsides too, but it is a whole new level of transparency that the business world is going to have to get used to. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you, Maya, for uh, for that article in UC today. <laughs> Let's. Uh, well, we've got a little bit of tech uh, news also coming a bit later, but that's a much easier one. Uh, but let's look at this. 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 Uh, let's look at what's happening with the office. What people? How people are? What's happening to the office? To the physical mm. office? Uh, and um, and I just like to say, I don't know if I said this in the last one, but I heard uh, some prime minister say, oh, be- well, and lots of people are saying going back to work where a lot of people have already been working, they're just going back to the office. Uh, But there are a lot of people that need to get back to work because they haven't been able to do uh, their work remotely or who've been furloughed or whatever. So I would would like people to use that phrase in a more specific way. But anyway, that's one (laughs) one thing. (laughs) So um, there's a couple of, there's a few articles. So the first one is uh, in the, I think two of them are in The Guardian. Uh, This one is from The Guardian from the 5th of August, 2020. And it says, UK office office demand shifting to the suburbs amid COVID-19 crisis. And this is like, this is like, you know, when all the uh, remote advocates get together and they wish for something and they say, we won't work and do this. And they're like, wow, it's happening, people. (laughs) It's happening. Yes. (laughs) This flipping. Um, Yeah. So excellent. and that's all it is. I think it's, uh, it's. Oh, oh, sorry, my 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 thing. In the excitement, I pressed another link and I went to another article. But um, it's basically, as I remember, sorry, sorry, listeners, sorry, Maya. Uh, I think it was uh, my husband who um, showed me this article. I was like, email it, email it to me. Uh, and it is, oh, now it's asking me to register. Okay. So sorry, people. Yeah, it's the cover. It's getting really hot. <laughs> <laughs> calm, calm down. So, um, yeah, it's a very so, short article. There isn't yes. that much to it, to be no. honest. It's obviously come from a, off the back of a press release from IWG, which used to be Regis serviced offices, and they've been around as a brand forever. Um, yes. But they have always focused on the more kind of local high street rather than city centre type um, office spaces and they're clearly seeing a, a bit of a renaissance and I think it's great news for the high street in particular um, we've had all sorts of dire news about retail and other spaces I think it was in the news this morning that Marks and Spencers are laying people off and you know if the idea of working locally rather than commuting to a big city as an alternative to working from home people can have that office experience but they can do it in their own community and claim back those hours and 
um, carbon miles of commuting and actually work in an office but in their own neighbourhood, I think this is all going to be really good for communities in the long run. Yeah. Um, to, to quote the second paragraph, uh, IWG has experienced a surge in interest in flexible office spaces outside the big cities, as well as its home working packages, which include furniture, rental, insurance, telecom lines, video conferencing, stationery and repairs. I didn't know they had this uh, this uh, service. No, that's, of, new, isn't it? <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, it's a yeah. So that's it's. It is. It. I think. I think it's great. I think anything that uh, starts to um, level level the different uh, bits, the different um, geographies of a country, uh, that the level, different societies, different. So I'm not being very uh, eloquent, but anything that's going to bring a little bit more equality in the distribution of the population, I think that's really good. Definitely. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's it is about thinking about having choices again about where we work rather than being forced to work from home and people embracing that choice to really think about what they want. And for some, that will be an office environment of some kind, but it might be a lot more small and local and closer to home than the one that they used to commute to. Yeah. So I'm subscribed to the newsletter of Bernie J. Mitchell. Um, and in uh, Bernie is a real co-working advocate, also remote working and freelancer. But really the co-working space is where, where he, I think he, he's, he's making the most impact. And in his newsletter, he's been talking about, and I don't know whether, I can't remember if this is a phrase he's come up with or he's heard from someone, about the 15-minute city. And I believe that that is about, yeah, having everything you need within 15 minutes of your home. Uh, and I think this starts to bring that, that it, commuting and going to, having long commutes and stuff. Some people might like it because of that disconnect and stuff. But I think that anything that gives us the option of not having to have only that lifestyle is yeah. just absolutely wonderful. I love the idea of a 15 minute <laughs> radius of being able to buy what you want, meet who you want, um, access yes. the services that you need and so on. And maybe that's what will finally get people out of their cars and onto their bikes and things like that. Yeah. And really investing in their local communities, not just financially, but socially, emotionally yes. and in other ways. And then on a similar line, so this is also from The Guardian a few days later, 13th of August. Uh, it's an opinion piece by Simon Jenkins. And he says, the age of the office is over. The future lies in Britain's commuter town. So this is a very, it's, it's very similar. Um, and what I liked about this one, it gives us a little bit of data of what's happening in the UK. Uh, and he says, when in March, Boris Johnson uh, ordered Britons to stay at home, I heard a death knell sound. So shocking mm. was this fear-based lockdown that a new Morgan Stanley service shows that even now only 34% of British office workers have gone back to work. Yeah. 34% compared with 76% in Italy and 83% in France. Mm. I think it's fascinating that actually, because Johnson was really making the case for people to go back to the office for yes. for all the micro uh, micro systems that are, uh, all the e economy that is around those offices also. But people have said, Mm -mm. Uh -uh. Not yet, Boris. <laughs> We've a Morgan mm -hmm. Stanley haven't gone back to work. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I think yeah. the message is a little bit um, not congruent with the reality there that people obviously don't feel safe yet going back to the, the thronging city centres where, where they used to, to work and they realise they do have a viable alternative now. So it's definitely going to change things. Um, and I like that they say uh, later on, this need not be bad news for cities. The mm. decline in offices will leave more space for housing. Culture and leisure activities will recover. Historic quarters, if conserved, will attract the creative industries that are seen as holding the key to modern city economies, etc., etc. I think I really like, this is so important and I hope we can go back to these kind of conversations, which is, yes. okay, what are we doing by changing the way in which we meet to work and in which mm. we work with others. How does that affect our local communities? How does that affect the bigger picture? Um, I think it's fascinating. Yes, and it is. I mean, I, I like the optimism inherent in the idea that mm. city centres yes. will thrive and recover. I think it's going to be quite a long-term recovery. Yes. Um, initially, there will be a lot of pain simply because of the way that these spaces are presently organised and the way that property prices are so inflated in places like London and San Francisco and so on. And, you know, there's, there's going to be a hell of a shakeout 
Um, and eventually, yes, I agree. I think that city centres could become much nicer places to go to for certain specific things, including a great deal of the history that's tied up in them. Um, but there might be quite a lot of pain along the way for people who are tied up in the real estate there or the service industries that are supporting the people who aren't coming back to work and so on. So it's going to be a lot of upheaval, I fear. Yeah, any shift. Mm. Uh, yes, and we're looking at the positives <laughs> because we yeah. don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but there is a lot. Yeah, thanks. it's important to remind that. Thank you, Maya. Well, um, I think it will be good, I hope. Yes, this is, this is the, yeah, this is, of course, the hope. Um, and thank you, Richard McKinnon from My Pocket Psych for sharing that article, which was actually for an episode we we're going to record, but I thought I'd include it here again. This is the, um, the future of Britain commuter towns. Uh, but before we move on to the next section of our what's going on. Um, there is, of course, another way that this could go. And my, you found this gem of an article. Uh, can I, can I read the, the, <laughs> can you, can you give me the on, can you make, give me, um, can you do me the honor of uh, allowing me to read the Go for it. I know, you, I know you want to. <laughs> so this is from uh, uh, the MGM Resorts uh, <laughs> website and MGM Resorts rolls out the ultimate Work from Vegas package at Bellagio and Aria. And this is from the 6th of August. Maya, tell us about this. Oh, well, there's, there's so much about 2020 that has often felt a little bit surreal <laughs> working in the remote workspace and, and, you know, talking about the future of work. Um, I accept the fact that there are lots of ways this could go and lots of possible models for people to find new ways for getting things done. But this one just had me going, really? Um, the idea of, of Viva Las Office is a package which I guess is being rolled out by increasingly empty and desperate hotels in Vegas to provide luxury accommodation, comfortable workspaces, resort perks, and even air travel door to door. So, you know, you don't have to commute with the hoi polloi. Um, you can go and work from home if you want to in a Vegas hotel. So, um, yeah, you can do your work with nice fast broadband, then you can go and sit by the pool and then you can put all your salary into a slot machine or a roulette table if you want to. Um, really, really weird. Um, I, I, I did wonder at first if this was some kind of satire or joke, but I don't think it is. No, but th you see, for me, they get that remote work does not mean working from home. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yes, I guess them that. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the thing. One of the reasons that uh, my husband is not on holiday, but he, his, uh, his normal workplace is in, uh, in, in, a, in a space, in a physical space. But because of what's happened, they've, he's actually been able to, to move online. Um, and this was the thing. It's like, well, if, if we're still going to be home working in August, then I'll go over to Denia. So, mm. you know, we could have gone to Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Packages so, uh, from $100 a night, including yes. accommodations, executive assistant to coordinate details as required throughout the visit. Isn't that what hotels do normally anyway? Um, well, yes. <laughs> And, uh, time is money. You can have um, a poolside so, massage if you want, if it's all too much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think this deserves a jingle. Great. So uh, let's move on to um, some. So some stuff is coming up now around work life uh, boundaries. Uh, and of course, uh, the health of remote workers has always been something that we're interested in. But also now we've got all the added stuff, as to say. And now that the remote working population has increased, then uh, of course, we want we want to pay even more attention uh, to it. So um, HBR has actually um, has actually released a series of office-related, remote working-related articles, which is really worth looking at. And uh, there's two articles in particular that I think might be interesting to, to look at. And one of them, Maya, was um, one that looks at these work-life boundaries and mm. it suggests two different types of people. So uh, we, we, I thought that even that was interesting if yes. I can pull this down to, yeah. So building work-life boundaries in the WFH era. Uh, this is from July 15th, 2020. And it says uh, that you could, you could uh, talk about people uh, setting the boundaries or not of their work and uh, of their work life and their non-work life in two ways. One kind of People are called integrators, 
and they are the ones that, uh, well, that they, they don't mind integrating stuff. So they are, uh, and I'm quoting, they might be comfortable performing work tasks during family time and doing family tasks during work time in speech marks. Uh, they often work after office hours and take care of personal matters, such as paying bills or making doctor's appointments during work time. And then they have the segmenters who um, they have a strong desire to keep their office and family life separate. So, and they put boundaries around time, etc. So I just found this, this thing of, are you an integrator or a segmenter? Could be quite an interesting conversation to understand where we're at. Definitely. Uh, I think it's a fascinating model. Um, I Just to caveat it initially, I think I do wonder a little bit about this whole idea of our integrators just quicker switching segmenters, this whole idea of multitasking and you're not really blending, you're just better at switching from one role to another without so much friction or downtime as other people had. So there might be something in that, but I do think it's a really interesting way to start the conversation. And I think probably a lot of the people who are naturally drawn to remote working or working from home might be quite integrated people who are used to having more of a blend and more of an overlap. And going to an office is a very segmenting thing that I do my work in this place and then I come home. doesn't mean that people who find themselves naturally towards the segmenter end of the spectrum, if it is a spectrum, are can't make it work at home, but they might need quite specific things to kind of help with those boundaries and that segmentation. Mm. I, uh, I'm i a segmenter, though. I think that the yeah. reason why I, I, yeah, I, I really like, I'm either doing one thing or I'm doing the other. Um, but yeah. and it's interesting that they found that segmenters are happier and more committed when they have access to flexi time, because then you mm-hmm. can just block the time yes. away. Um, I, I, it would really drive me crazy if I had to do all my exercise every day at six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, interesting. It is. Yes, it reminded me of a conversation I had years ago with somebody I worked with who we both worked from home, but I realised now she was a very strong segmenter and that this was a, a cultural obstacle between us. And I remember calling her once she was getting her home office rebuilt and she was waiting for the delivery of a desk and I called her and she was sitting on the floor in her office um, because her old desk had been collected and her new one hadn't been delivered yet. I was like, what, why on earth are you trying to work on the floor? You know, I knew she had a perfectly good sofa and dining Mm -hmm. room table but she was like no this is my office I don't take work into the rest of my home I don't want it there it doesn't belong there she'd rather sit uncomfortably on the floor for a day um, because that was where she did her work and she was absolutely inflexible about that and that worked for her and she would never work on the move or you know on business travel and things like that you know work was there and life was there and the boundaries are very clear between them and this this model uh, makes sense of how surprised I was at that conversation years yeah. later. Yeah, and also they talk about, uh, you're talking about space, so she uses space for mm-hmm. that. Um, but she was also of- very rigid about the time thing as yeah. well, you know, uh, exactly. yes, clocking off here and, and she was very good at sort of checking in in the morning and checking out at night and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So if we don't have one, we must make use of the other. I'm just thinking of all the people who haven't had a choice of mm. space, but they've maybe had a choice uh, of time. And sometimes if you don't have the choice of time, you might be able to separate by space. So yes. time and space, really, um, really interesting. The other article that, again, I thought would be um interesting to bring to our listeners' attention uh, through our conversation is it is again an HBR and it's from a team at Microsoft who I think this is great. I really enjoyed mm. reading this. Microsoft analyzed data on its newly remote workforce. So this is Microsoft saying, we've got all these assumptions. Um, let's see. Let's see what's really going on. And this is from July 15th, 2020. So I invite listeners to look at these articles. But what are one or two things, Maya, that stood out most for you? Um, what stood out? Well, I think one of the first things was this, was the methodology and the kind of coining of the phrase of workplace analytics as part of the whole data and analytics spectrum. Now that work is digital, we can actually measure it in ways that we couldn't when people came to offices, did their thing, and there were some outputs from the team or the individual. Um, Whereas now we do have these incredibly rich sources of data about how people are using different tools or volumes of messaging, time spent on this and that. Um, So I think just that as a concept is, is really interesting. 
I think it's also very interesting that Microsoft are doing this, that they care about it. Obviously, they make a lot of the tools that people use for remote work, including Teams, which is just soaking up market share and unbelievable rate. But the fact is that they are concerned about, um, they have a 350 person modern workplace transformation team dedicated to this. And these were the people that they consulted. So um, I think, I think the way that they flipped this round, looked at it, looked at which aspects were driven by employees, um, looked at some of the, the changes and the things that helped pe- that helped people do their work well, like the role of managers, particularly in supporting people. There were also some negatives that they found, like things like communication and work bleeding more into the evenings and this idea of a night shift, which used to be people catching up on deep work. But now there's a lot more messaging going on between individuals in that time and things like that. But I think when you have these analytics, you can at least observe that and say, okay, this is happening. Is this a trend we want? Then no, then let's do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. I I liked all that as well. Um, And I, one of the things that I found uh, interesting was the, they looked very specifically at how manager one-on-ones affected Mm. the time that people spent. Now they say collaborating, which I think maybe means in meetings. I can't remember. Um, Listen, so you have to read the article to to get that. (laughs) But but it was interesting that uh, the higher manager uh, one-to-one time, so the more that uh, people were meeting with the managers one-to-one, the less that those people were then spending uh, working overall. So I think the theory is that, well, they say actually one manager, the challenges of this time help me understand the need to get to know my employees better and focus my efforts on their goals. Mm. So really... I. I've seen, I mean, we, we know managers have been doing more one-to-ones. Managers have, in, in general, been doing loads more meetings and they've taken on a lot of, the, um, yeah, they've, 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 yeah, they've had to take on more meeting time and more individual uh, consideration and attention to people that we, we know that's been happening. Um, the other thing that I found interesting also uh, is, and I'll read, is... Um, the managers sent uh, 100. So, so the so the interesting thing about uh, Microsoft, of course, is that they're always analyzing all their data. Um, uh, Marta Teshidor, who used to be in Yammer, who's now still in Microsoft, she was on the podcast something like episode eight, ten, or something. I went to their <laughs> office to interview her. So that that's how long ago we're we're talking about. Mm. And she later on, I I was asking her to talk me through some of the new features of that, that when before teams and she showed me look we can see here how many how much time you spent on email who you're emailing to and I was like oh my god <laughs> the, uh, a real like you could really see what everyone was doing and like you say Maya now on top of that we also have all the real-time interaction in in meetings uh, which we didn't have before mm-hmm. so they saw that compared uh um, that managers sent 115% more IMs in March compared with 50% more for individual contributors. So uh, managers during during March, even when the, the pandemic, um, I think we were still, not everyone was still doing uh, in lockdown, um, they were sending 115% more instant messages than, uh, than other team members who were sending 50% more, which is also a lot. So a lot of fingers typing very quickly. Yeah, but really, really highlighting the absolutely pivotal role of managers in making all of this work. And, you know, we know from the managers that we work with as as clients that they're not always that middle management layer where they've got lots of supervisory responsibilities, but also an awful lot of accountability upwards and people that they have to deliver on for. And, you know, it's it's often not a role that's terribly well supported, even when things aren't in a state of global chaos. So I, I really hope that in the long term, we'll end up celebrating the successes of lots of managers in holding things together and helping teams be productive. This research definitely underlines how important that is and eventually we'll be able to evaluate which teams and managers did that better than others. And then I want to quote uh, a, a very, I mean, you were talking about the negative stuff that they've discovered. And this is something I've heard uh, that I've heard people say that they didn't, that they've, 
because everyone's been working so hard and such long hours to make the work work during pandemic, those who've been able to work remotely, it's been like all hands on deck, uh, no, non-stopping, working weekends, this and that. And someone said to me, I hope we're not, the problem is we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it well. We're still alive. We hope there's not this expectation is going to carry mm. on. And yeah. this starts to address that even when they start to go back to the workplace. So um, this is a very nice uh, thing straight from the article. We know the future will be increasingly digital, flexible and remote friendly or even remote first. Hey, HBR has the words remote first in it. <laughs> um, and, and as organizations across the globe shift back to the office, measuring patterns of work against a baseline and keeping an eye on how people adapt will be essential, especially if new waves of disruption bring new unknowns. For example, yes. our colleagues in China, so Microsoft China, who have already moved large parts of their workforces back to the office, are seeing that some of the hab uh, habits that emerge during remote work, such as more reliance on instant messaging and longer work weeks, have continued even after their return. Mm. So I think that really is something to look out for um, that, well, we, we'll have some communication habits that we want to keep. So identify those, name those, and then uh, make sure that you are able to continue doing them. But identify those that you don't want to keep. Name them. Yes. <laughs> Look oh, out no. for them. Yes. Uh, let and them then go. Yeah. And let them go. But naming them is so important. Yes. And I d it is difficult when you're in the middle of it, I think. You know, it's great that we're starting to see this wave of research emerge now. Um, but it's happening at quite a strategic level. And these are the conversations we really want to see happening within organizations and teams. What's working for us? What did we like? What didn't we like? Um, you know, who do we thank? Who do we acknowledge for going above and beyond? But when do we sort of draw a line and say, I'm, I'm not going to use the phrase new normality, because I know you hate it and it, it's not applicable anyway. But when do we say we're not firefighting anymore? But this yeah. is a this is a shift and these are the transitions we want to keep um, and find some way to move forward, um, which is going to be reasonably consistent, even allowing for the fact that there, there might be ongoing disruption in our lives that maybe we'll be better prepared for another time. But we can't stay in that adrenaline, um, all hands on deck, fight to survive mode because people burn out. And it's where months down the line now we need to start thinking about what things are going to look like longer term. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that all of that, all of that, I would really encourage you to have a look at those articles. They're really meaty and the whole series, I think it's really great. Mm -hmm. So the links will be in the show notes and the show notes live over at virtualnotdistant.com. Right, we've got two more things. They're a bit shorter uh, and I've just realized that... Uh, I don't have all the details for one of them, but oh, here we go. Let's go. So uh, the first one is I listened to, I don't know if you've managed to have a listen at the question and answer that um, the Rework podcast showed uh, for Basecamp. So let yes, me start again. Yes, this was the one a few weeks ago, then I think I yes. did listen to it. Yes. Yeah, excellent. So... Uh, some of you might know that definitely the Basecamp followers know that Basecamp has released a new type of email called Hey. And honestly, they must have gone through the most amazing journey because they had problems with Apple. I mean, you can mm -hmm. listen to their podcast. It's, it's really great, actually. And I was listening to the first part of their question and answers where they, well, where they answer questions about Hey and about some of the uh, decisions they've made. They've been very bold in some decisions. Uh, and kudos to them, they've gone back on some of those decisions after they got people testing them. And I just, uh, well, one, for me, the most interesting thing is that they are not just releasing another email thing. They want to change how people use email. And I just thought it was interesting uh, that they are that they are doing that. What do you think, Maya? <laughs> I think, yeah, brilliant. And if anybody could remake email, um, it would be the the guys at base camp and it was and they don't think small <laughs> it's good to say yes we're going to take on email um i got on the beta i downloaded it i had a play there were things that i liked about it and i think just from a productivity point of view the way that they've really thought about how we organize information and the way that our inbox presents 
all of this stuff all clumped together but that's it's up to us to decide how we want to process it and when do we want to see it and gmail kind of had a shot at this years ago with their different tabs but their rules for for doing that were much less user controlled whereas hey kind of lumps things together much more under if you it doesn't matter whether something's from a forum or from a brand or whatever. If you don't want to see it every day, you can just chuck it in the later pile and mm-hmm. get rid of it and so on. So it's really powerful in that sense. Um, I think in in other ways, it's I found it really inflexible. And this reflects this, the way they developed it, as yeah. they were saying in the podcast, that they built it because they didn't like email and they wanted something better. So they built the thing that they wanted and then opened it up to other people. And yes, they did then roll back on some of those things like email signatures. They said, we don't have any signatures. You know, people attach all this rubbish at the end of each email and we don't need to see that. Um, and then other people said, well, yes, we kind of do. Um, and we might need <laughs> links to other ways to communicate and other sources of information or something. So they rolled back on that. The one thing they didn't roll back on was letting you import existing email addresses in through IMAP or POP3. Um, so basically it means having a new at hey.com email address um, and sort of declaring email bankruptcy and starting it over, which is a lovely idea, um, but it's a little bit of an unrealistic fantasy, I think, for most people, unless you you know, you know really hate email and you're so buried alive by it and that's the only way you can transition your life. Um, but for me, it doesn't work because of that. You know, it would just give me one more e- email address, one more place to check. Yeah, they have forwards and stuff like that, but that's that's yeah, that's not what I. But you can't reply to that. Yeah, you can't yeah. use the same yeah. tags and filters that you've yeah. got in Gmail. And yeah, it's if you were starting from a blank slate, I'd say definitely go for it. I think that they've taken a really intelligent approach to it. I think what's really interesting, like you said, something like the signature wasn't included because mm. for them it represents one thing, but actually you can use signatures in different ways. Uh, signatures are some, are, there is some, you can use it to say something. So for I'll give you an example. Um, so in my iPhone, I have my signature now says something like uh, sent from the, so no, uh, sent, uh, sent from the phone, probably sitting on the sofa, excuse the typos. <laughs> uh, and, and really, and people have picked up on it and they say oh that's a nice uh, it's it's an it's an opportunity the signature now that we know that it's there and stuff it can also be an opportunity to show some of our personality yeah. um I, I wrote a whole blog post on you can change the signature in all kinds of email to sh- to give visibility to your team to what you're doing to so i think i found that I just wanted to mention that because I think sometimes it's not about getting rid of something, but it's about using something differently. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I love was the story that they're saying, let's use, let's do a different kind of email, but actually everyone wants features that allows them to use it like they're already using it. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, and that is We're stuck with great. email, aren't we? We can't just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's that thing of, it happens with, I've, I've when I've introduced tech to people, um, they always will ask, the questions are always not about what is new about it, but whether it can do something that what they're already using does. And mm-hmm. I think it's really important to understand this when we are transitioning, especially for those of us that just want to <laughs> learn how to do everything, um, that that is where we are in our minds. So when I've talked to people about the Remarkable tablet, which is an e-paper, which is a paper substitute, everyone wants to know how it connects to the internet and how it's mm-hmm. similar to the to the iPad, for example. Right. Um, or when I first introduced Trello to someone, uh, instead of making a list by making different cards, they made one card and within the card they made a list, just typed it out. Or you know, it's it's until you... You have to break down where you're at yes. and then see how you can use the new thing in a different way. So I really, I think that was such an interesting reflection about the, the email things. Like people, the people are just asking us about features of what they're already using. <laughs> <laughs> when we are starting to use a new piece of tech, whether it be Hey or whatever, remember who this was built for. We've said about this a lot of times. The tools are designed to make you work and collaborate in a certain way. If it's not working for you, it's not that something wrong with you. <laughs> it might be that you need a different tool because this is usually, especially with a lot of these tools, uh, teams make them because they're, yeah. they're good for them. I mean, we've had, we've, we've heard, we've heard developers and it's, it's important to, to remember that, um, that, um, yeah. And yeah, kudos, kudos to them. So let's, let's end with, uh, with something else that another 
company that we well, that we love and like, and that uh, of course we've had Marcus Wormuth uh, talk on this show a lot, and it's Buffer. And I was like, I don't know how they're doing. I haven't looked into this. I haven't talked to anyone about it. I just saw it and I thought, okay, let's mention it. They are doing. Oh, it's today. Oh, what's the date today? Mm. Oh, no, tomorrow. It's today and tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, listeners. So August 19th and 20th of 2020, the, the conference is called Built to Last, and it's the first ever audio conference, and it's for brand builders. I thought this is interesting. I don't know. So maybe we should get someone to come and talk to us about this after. Yeah, because it's, it's happening now. Well, it would be really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, it's it's happening this week, so um, I might still sign up for it. I would love to hear how this goes because people are really struggling at the moment to make virtual events work really effectively and really engage people, and they're struggling to find ways to make them not watching a webinar. Um, this idea of doing audio only seems really quite challenging and dramatic, and, you know, I... I think there's something about not having to watch and not having to create visual distraction that might let you focus on the message in a new way. I I really do want to sign up for it and have a listen in because I can't wait to see how they pull this off. If anyone can, Buffer can. Well, it's just, it's uh, it's live audio. It's podcasts. <laughs> it's, uh, mm, yeah, but two whole days of yeah, podcasts. Um, yeah. I don't know how many hours it is all together, but... I yeah, yeah I mean yes. Let's let's <laughs> let's see if we can talk to someone about it because I think this is so great. You're getting people away from the the screen, especially now. You know, especially now mm-hmm. that we know that. Yes. Um, so I think um, yeah, it's it's so interesting and it's like yay audio. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what's um, let's see what we've uh, what some of the people that uh, that again that uh, we are in touch with have been up to. You can connect with other listeners by sharing your thoughts via our contact form at virtualnotdistance.com. So Maya, people are doing really interesting stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think uh, we don't have any listener feedback uh, this month, I think. No, but that's okay because we've got lots of other stuff to, to tell you about. But remember, listeners, if any of the episodes are of special interest or if you just want to say hello, I'm listening, then we would love to hear from you. Virtualnotdistant.com for our long form messages and Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com for email or if you want want to come to our LinkedIn page and comment there. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and then you can talk to other listeners through us. We are your, your conduit. Um, so we've got a couple of things that uh, that are happening. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, so Ro- uh, Rowena Hennigan, who has been, she's had two uh, segments uh, in in this um, in this show in different in two different episodes and Sandra Thompson have set up a new company to deliver workshops for distributed teams around emotional intelligence. So I just wanted to mention that to listeners in case it's of interest. And I recorded today with them, and they told me their new website address, <laughs> which is riseinei.com. So Oh, that's how you say it. I was looking at it, trying to work it out. Yes, makes total sense now. Yeah, that's it. So um, they will be uh, on this podcast next episode. I'll be talking to them about precisely that, emotional intelligence in remote teams. But I thought it'd be great to hear, um, yeah, for you to check out their website if you want listeners. Right, then we've got uh, other stuff that's happening from our network Um so uh, Brian Rea has uh, developed, uh, well, has put together a guide to engage in remote workers. It's a guide for managers um, to, uh, yeah, a, a guide for managers of remote teams. And it's all about em- remote employee engagement and is out there on his website for free. And of course, uh Brian was on this show. <laughs> he was part of the mm-hmm. uh, connection and disconnection in remote teams that uh, Brie from Shield Geo was hosting, and so I just thought, well, that's that's excellent. Let's uh, let's plug it. <laughs> Definitely, I haven't had a chance to read this yet because I went to take a look and thought, oh my God, this is huge. Yes. <laughs> um, it's actually a you know a very in depth piece of content. It's very generous to give it away, um, and. 
I have bookmarked it to have a thorough read of it very soon and I hardly recommend you do the same based on what we already know of Brian's work. Yeah, it's nice. It's a, it's a, it's a good chunky and it's got, it's got some interesting stuff um, that we don't usually see around the importance of uh, career development and showing an interest in, in, um, in team members' development and how important mm. that is. So yeah, it's a really, really interesting. Have a look. We'll um, uh, stick the link in the show notes. And talking of uh, books, <laughs> more of a, a, a paperback and a fully released uh, uh, thing. Lisette Sutherland's book, uh, Work Together Anywhere, is, has been translated to the Japanese. <laughs> well, yes, that's very cool. Well, domination, <laughs> Lisette. <laughs> Yeah, I, I loved the caption. She said that she thought it. they printed it back to front for a moment <laughs> when she opened it. So I, I think it's brilliant. So that's really, really great. Um, and then, uh, then Maya, can I share a few of my personal updates? I hope you will. <laughs> so um, I'm running a webinar with, I think we mentioned in the last uh, show, which is today, <laughs> today as in the 3rd of September when this is released. So you might not be able to make it, but it is, it's not actually a webinar. It's a, I said a webinar, but I meant workshop all around plant spontaneity. And um, well, I don't know what we'll do, but I have to plan it. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be spontaneous. Will it be recorded? Pilar, no, in case anybody's no, because it? it's a workshop. So it's not a talk, oh, okay. it's not so a webinar. You have to be yeah, done. it's it's a workshop. <laughs> so I might record it, but if, if we record it, it'll be for internal. Um, and we'll be, i just really curious to workshop the concept of planned spontaneity and see see what it's about uh, and what people come up mm. with. And this is with Next Stage Radicals, which also has a website, uh, the Next Stage Radicals website. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and also I was... Um, on their podcast uh, on episode seven, which was released on the 3rd of August, 2020, talking, talking about me, <laughs> a little bit about, uh, yeah, a little bit about remote teams and stuff, but actually it was, re yeah, it was interesting to just reflect back on, on, on how I'd got here. Uh, what, what, uh, yeah. So check that out. Um, and then I am thinking Maya of, uh, uh, well, actually, before that, the visible teamwork, your guide to visible teamwork is almost, it's about to be released, hopefully by the time this episode right. is published. And this is, listeners, is it's basically, it's a guide to visible teamwork. It's very lightweight, uh, and but it just goes through the concept so that you can have a look and decide, okay, well, let me implement this and this and forget about the rest. Uh, and we've got, we've got loads of um, little cartoons, I hope. I hope it's useful. We shall see. We'll we'll see what feedback we we get. Uh, but it's it's the next step before the book. Uh, I'm I've started writing the book on visible teamwork. Well, I started the new draft of it, uh, and I'm thinking of blogging the book, Maya. Not oh, y interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought where or how yet, but I think I might do that because oh, it's so boring to write for yourself. <laughs> 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 so I'm thinking, I'm just going to get it out there. I can always um, delete it or whatever after it. But I think it might be interesting to 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 see. And also it might get, people might um, come up with stuff as we're writing it or, or maybe nothing. Or maybe it's just a little bit of that extra working out loud that we, yes. that we advocate for. Um, and then on that, I've got lots of stuff. This is because I've been on holiday. Uh, <laughs> I've started a personal newsletter called Think Write Converse, which is uh, is just uh, th thing, things that are in my head uh, and stuff around writing. So listeners, you are very welcome to join it. I'm managing to get it out every week. It's uh, <laughs> Anish, uh, well, lovely Anish said, it's it's like stream of consciousness. <laughs> so, so if you're looking for polished writing, not the place, but if you're just looking to get into someone's mind for 10 minutes, then... Uh, get in Pilar's <laughs> head. Don't we don't want. often get an opportunity for that. So <laughs> check it out. After listening to this. Um, so yes, we, uh, Maya will stick the link in your show notes. Oh, Maya, this duvet is getting... <laughs> you need to shake the duvet off and get down to the beach. Anything, anything else uh, we need to tell our listeners before we stop the recording? This will be coming out to you in the, the early part of September, so that'll be kind of lots happening, back to school, some people going back to offices and more changes in the world. So we wish you success with all of that. 
and look forward to talking to you again soon. And let us know if you're doing any mm. of that, especially if you are going back to an office or some kind of co-working or workspace. If you want to share, uh, you can always be an anonymous. I was going to say anonymous. Um, you can always be anonymous if you want to, or if you just want to talk to us and share it with Maya and I, then that's also allowed. But it would be lovely if you sent us something that we can share with our listeners uh, at some point. It doesn't have to be right in September 2020. If you're listening to this later on, we'd love to hear from you again. So virtual, not distant dot com for your long form messages at virtual teamwork with a zero as the O in work on Twitter. We have a LinkedIn page uh, and Becky is putting out content there. So you can also comment there, get in touch there. And Maya is Maya Middle Miss on Twitter and I am Pilar Orti. And you listeners are wonderful. Thank you for staying to the end of this episode. Uh, we'll leave you now with the stock outro. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.